Welcome to Real Physics. Today I'm talking about how the Hubble redshift is explained by variable speed of light. You know that uh, variable speed of light was Einstein's first idea when dealing with general relativity. Uh, all this is in my history video and uh, there are also very intriguing features of variable speed of light li like uh, Max principle and maybe for the uh, technical part of this clip it's important that you uh, have uh, watched before the video about the gravity explained by variable speed of light because I will refer to this a little bit but uh, well let's now talk about what we're going to explain before explaining and what is the cosmological redshift. Uh, Edwin Hubble uh, who was the first one who discovered the very or proved the very existence of galaxies that was his first uh, important discovery, then went ahead and uh, confirmed that distant galaxies have um, light redshifted and the, the amount of the redshift is proportional to the distance. That was a very important finding and to be historically fair we should also mention uh, Milton Humason and George Lemaitre. Anyway, um, so uh, th this was a game-changing discovery in cosmology that distant galaxies appear redshifted and Hubble was quick to assign a velocity to this uh, redshift which was a quite natural idea because um, the uh, Doppler effect was well known for acoustic waves and it makes sense at first sight to say okay the light is redshifted it's probably this distant galaxy is moving away from us so uh, but uh, well I want to uh, open a broader perspective here I mean the the cosmological redshift is almost uh, equated with the expansion of the universe you know? uh, if, if you think about distant galaxies are, are moving faster away than the more uh, closer galaxies it's very natural that you think about a, a general expansion but this is not uh, really necessary and uh, first of all I think we forgot to wonder about the very existence of this phenomenon because um, as Thomas Kuhn in his famous uh, book The Structure of Scientific Revolutions in 1962 pointed out normal science usually goes ahead uh, uh, discovering anomalies describing that with a free parameter and all this leads to a complication okay but I mean we, we seem to have forgotten that this was a surprise okay the very existence of the uh, cosmological redshift and people don't explain any any longer uh, things we, we are too much used in contemporary physics just to take out a description and this is a number and that's it and I mean <laughs> there's a lot of literature and cosmologists wondering about the measurement of the Hubble constants which is a story a separate story and uh, then we have uh, more precise measurements and right now they are discussing the so-called Hubble tension I mean one experiment says it's this value and it's another value but uh, and, and of course the, the, the uh, age of the universe uh, changes correspondingly but the elephant in the room is I mean why does physics at all need such, such an expansion I mean who uh, who the hell uh, told the universe to expand in first place? This is the question we must address. And uh, I think variable speed of light has a good, very good answer. That's why I make this video. The Hubble constant is just an unexplained free parameter and, and we are too much used to, to, to describing this stuff. Well, for the explanation, let's go uh, back to the paper in 1957. I have already mentioned several times in the other videos and it really contains a lot of scientific gems. Max principle and he corrected for Einstein's error in 1911 and described relativity. And um, one thing almost forgotten or overlooked is on page uh, 375 
Robert Dickey provides an alternative explanation for the cosmological redshift. So now, listen to this. This might uh, thought to cause a blue shift. However, a photon loses energy with increasing and in, in, uh, twice the rate. So hence there is a net shift to toward the red. And he also says electromagnet. It's easily seen from Maxwell's equations that for time dependent but space independent index of refraction, an electromagnetic wave propagates without a change in wave length. That's really huge, but I don't think he explained it very well. And, and maybe for this, it didn't get the attention it deserved. So let's get into uh, this uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, a reminder how Dickey was able to explain all the tests of uh, general relativity with this concept of variable speed of light, uh, a spatially variable speed of light. In this context, you assume that in the proximity of masses, the speed of light um, is decreased here. But um, since always C equals a wavelength times frequency holds, this uh, decrease in the speed of light has to be distributed to uh, a decrease of lambda and a decrease of uh, the frequency. Okay, so this really nicely explains the relativistic effect. But uh, mind the difference: uh, all this, all this discussion holds for atoms. Okay, and uh, the discussion is slightly different for propagating light, as he said. Uh, from Maxwell equation, it follows that they maintain their frequency. Oh, sorry, um, this is in the, already in the cosmological context, but first we're talking about the static case here. We're, we're not doing cosmology yet, we're just explaining the bending of light and the deflection and, uh, and, the, and the static case of a gravitational field. And, and of course the frequency cannot change here and just lambda changes. Um, and, but now imagine the other situation, okay? We're assuming a cosmos, which is homogeneous. There are no gradients of a lambda. And just imagine a laser cavity uh, that has a stationary wave inside it. And now let the speed of light decrease, okay? I mean, what should this cavity do? What, what should the light do? I mean, it cannot change its wavelength because that would, I mean, do you change from the light or, or from the left? I mean, the integer, um, the integer wave number would uh, certainly uh, be the same. So uh, that would produce a discontinuity. And for that reason, um, simply, uh, if you have propagating light, the uh, wavelength cannot change. That, on the other hand, means that all the change of C has to go in a frequency change. Okay. This is for the cosmological propagation of light. We are neglecting here uh, gradients and, and spatial dependence. So to be to be make this uh, really clear again, I, uh, let's uh, uh, confront the two situations. Here we have the laser cavity in the cosmos and a homogeneous uh, universe, but a temporal variation of C. Lambda has to be constant and all the change of C goes into the frequencies. On the other hand, as we know from classical optics, if we have light refraction for the same reason of, of uh, continuity, the frequency has to be a constant because otherwise you would produce temporal discontinuities okay, of a light wave entering a glass or water or whatever. So in this quasi-static um, situation where only a spatial variation of C occurs all the change of the speed of light goes into the wavelength. This, all this discussion, these two cases are for propagating light. Still another case is for atoms at rest, where, as we have seen, if you want to explain general relativistic effects, the change of C has to be equally distributed to lambda and f, the wavelength and frequency. Okay, um, this is the basis. So. If you remember, uh, that was the quantitatively now the uh, change in a uh, static gravitational field, the change of the C that was required and that distributes to wavelengths and frequencies and so on. And all other quantities are also affected by this change of measuring scales. And now 
we look at the cosmological evolution. We uh, derived um, Dicke's uh, spatial variation and also Newton's law in the other video from this ansatz and uh, saying that uh, c squared is a constant divided by the sum over all masses in the universe divided by the respective distance. And now you already realize that cosmologically the speed of light has to decrease because evidently, I mean, this sum over all masses um, increases as the horizons uh, increases as we look deeper into the universe as time proceeds there is just a bigger volume and more masses and correspondingly this sum has to increase. Now technically you can write this sum also as an integral yielding uh, well basically r to the third power as a volume of mass divided by r yields r uh, to the uh, second power and now you add another very simple uh, assumption that makes sense. You say, okay, I observe that uh, light spreads in the universe. That's what we see. That's the horizon. Okay. And that's just the definition of what we see, the horizon. The, the change in R uh, is just the speed of light. So if you uh, start from here, you have a simple uh, differential equation and that uh, yields an interesting result that the uh, temporal derivative of r squared must be a constant and you can introduce now an absolute time. Don't be afraid of, of, uh, of that absolute time we're talking about later, what you see, what you observe and how to fix that. But um, it just helps to understand that actually the speed of light has to decrease. And uh, as the horizon increases with the square of the absolute time, the speed of light accordingly decreases with the um, uh, square of the absolute time. And again, as we had before, this uh, change in the speed of light affects time and length scales because uh, the frequencies and, and uh, wavelengths both, both have to uh, be proportional to t to the minus um, one fourth. Okay, this is a little technical. Anyway, um, you arrive at a picture in which all measuring scales are time dependent. This is interesting and intriguing, and 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 provides a, a very new picture of the cosmological evolution. You have this abstract time. The horizon expands, but not linearly as assumed in conventional cosmology. The speed of light accordingly decreases and well, uh, all, all other quantities are affected. There are, uh, I will make another video that, that also refers to this um, table of measuring scales. But now we go ahead and uh, look, uh, well, cosmologically uh, evolution, as I said, has a consequence that uh, the, the light emitted from distant galaxies, um, no, sorry, uh, while uh, back then uh, the distant galaxies had a certain wavelength, they now have a decreased wavelength, okay? This was then and this is now, but if we talk about propagating light, the situation is different because propagating light has to maintain its wavelengths. So the wavelength emitted back then compared to the actual decreased wavelengths appears longer. That means redshifted. Okay, just another vi visualization. Maybe I'm a bit repetitive here. Um, you look at atomic scales and uh, the atomic scales contract and propagating uh, light cannot contract um, its wavelengths. So the result is light emitted from the distant galaxies appeared redshifted. And this is wonderful because it's an explanation of the cosmological redshift. Okay. So, um, yeah, just to add what, what, what kind of a fantastic picture emerges here. Dicke also mentions, uh, well, he assumes the cosmological principle that m means um, from any fixed point uh, matter is uniformly distributed and this implies that matter is on average fixed in position. Okay, 
keep in mind that in the in the uh, preceding argument we didn't talk about a velocity we just were talking about atoms sitting in their place emitting light and the universe um, the universe is not expanding materially that means all the galaxies basically remain at rest apart from the uh, well uh, velocities of, of which are due to att attraction and gravity and so on but uh, on average everything is at rest and and light from distant galaxies is necessarily redshifted here um, I'd like to mention um, well some people might call this uh, tired light but I don't like the the term because it, it seems like adding another uh, arbitrary uh, complication to all this but I mean what we have derived is a reason for the Hubble redshift that means the same the very same um, law the very same mechanism which is responsible for general relativity which causes the deflection of light um, verified by Eddington in 1919. The very same mechanism necessarily tells you that light from distant galaxies has to be redshifted. Okay? This is an explanation. And so, uh, yeah, it's kind of sad that um, Einstein uh, did not, uh, could not proceed in this direction. I, I mentioned other reasons for which he gave up variable speed of light approach much earlier. And he even met um, Edwin Hubble in 1931. But uh, at the time, what, apart from this very, a little bit superficial and, and publicity uh, aspect of the meeting, I think they were just dragged into other irrelevant discussions about different uh, cosmological models which were all wrong I mean had he uh, had he uh, followed on this variable speed of light approach early I think yeah the the uh, Hubble redshift could have been a wonderful confirmation also in this in this sense of uh, general relativity because it provides a unifying picture so to summarize variable speed cos uh, of light cosmology based on ideas of Einstein and Dicke, is based on a flat space with variable speed of light that describes general relativity. This is in other videos. The speed of light is determined by the distribution of masses and consequently it has to decrease with cosmological time. What we see here okay, uh, is of course an expanding universe, that, uh, sorry, uh, an expanding radius. That means we have a bigger amount of space we, we see each day because just light spreads. You can't keep light from spreading, but the matter in there is at rest as well. Okay. So this is the subtle difference here uh, to, uh, or maybe not so subtle, <laughs> it's a huge difference to conventional cosmology. And but the Hubble redshift is a consequence of decreasing Z. Matter in the universe is on average at rest, just light spreads. And uh, the apparent expansion is due to contracting measuring scales. So you can also call it a kind of an illusion, an illusory expansion. It's not, not a real expansion of the matter in the universe. It's just that light spreads and as a consequence you see that your usual, uh, your usual yardsticks are becoming shorter and for that reason it seems to you that the entire universe is expanding but actually it's not okay I think this is an yeah an intriguing uh, consequence first first of all due to the from an epistemological point of view because you were explaining something you're not just um, describing and yeah if you're interested in the details you'll find this paper in Annal de Physique and uh, there is uh, my book Einstein's Lost Key, How We Overlooked the Best Idea of the 20th Century that covers a lot of other topics too and this is available in a new edition now in uh, 2022. If you enjoyed the video don't forget to like it and if you're interested in fundamental questions of physics subscribe to this channel. Mm -hmm.